really excited to bring this word to you this morning. I, I believe you're going to be challenged by it. Uh, we are, this month is all about Jesus being the king. And uh, we, we love that he came as a little baby with very humble beginnings, but he did come as our king. And better than that, he's still our king. Praise God for that. And uh, we've been talking about that all month, and today's going to be no different. In fact, uh, I want to read my text verse to you this morning, and if you wouldn't mind standing with me as we like to do here as we honor God's word together. This is uh, the, the Apostle Paul and his letter to the church in Philippi, and he's talking about the, the nature of who Jesus was and is in our life today, uh, starting in verse five. He says, your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who being very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. That is basically describing the birth of Jesus that we are celebrating this month. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So now he's talking about the life that Jesus lived. Therefore, because of what Jesus did, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Can somebody say amen? amen. Praise God. That is a beautiful passage of scripture. I wanna to talk to you today about the fact that he is no ordinary king. Would you pray with me this morning? Our Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this time we have together today, God. Thank you that you are in residence here. We worship you today, Lord. We pray today, God, that you would do your work in our hearts. Father, we thank you so much for sending your son to die for us. Thank you for the, the celebration we can have today because of what happened 2,000 years ago. We are so grateful and we love you. We wanna honor you today through the rest of the time we have together. Let your name and your name alone be glorified in this place. And it is in the name of Jesus that we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you. You can be seated. So I'll start with a question this morning. I think it's still morning. Yep, a few more minutes. Um, what do your heroes look like? When you envision a hero, not a specific person, but just in general, uh, what would that person look like? Is it, a, is it a mighty warrior that just came off the battlefield? Or is it uh, maybe something a little more superficial, like an elite athlete? Or uh, maybe it's a, a great politician, somebody that's a really great leader. We all have different envision, things we envision when we think of our heroes. You know, I think for me, it's probably uh, some kind of a mix between a great warrior and an elite athlete, you know, like a, a Spartacus that can really throw a football well, something like that. Uh, but um, I, I, all of us have something we envision as a hero. And, and I think if, if we think about it, oftentimes a king can be someone that is considered a hero. Um, in fact, if you look at, the, at your Bible, in the Old Testament, many of the kings of the Old Testament definitely fit the mold of what a hero would look like. They were mighty warriors. They were revered, respected, and honored, and, and just had so much going for them, and people wanted to be like them and be them. And so kings were very respected. In fact, when Jesus came to the earth, when Jesus was an adult on the earth, when the time that, um, right before the Apostle Paul wrote my text verse today, when he was an adult on the earth, uh, the, the Jewish people were looking for a hero. They were looking for a king. They knew enough to know that the old prophecies of the Old Testament and the prophets of the Old Testament were saying that one day the Messiah was gonna come and he was gonna establish the throne of David in Israel forever. And many of the Jews misinterpreted this to mean that, well, the Messiah was gonna come and he was gonna deliver them from the Romans. It was gonna be this physical kingdom that he was going to have. And, and many of them thought that it was Jesus because especially uh, after he did some of the miracles he did, when he did the miracle where he turned five loaves of bread and two fish into enough food to feed 5,000 people, which by the way is one of the greatest, most incredible miracles ever recorded in the history of the world. When he did that, it says very clearly that the people knew that he was a prophet, that he was this guy that they were looking for. And so much so that it says that they were actually going to forcefully make him king. It says Jesus knew they were gonna forcefully make him the king, so he actually withdrew away from them because he, that wasn't the kind of king he was gonna be. He wasn't gonna be an ordinary king. He didn't come to deliver them from the Romans. He came to deliver them from themselves. He came to deliver the human race. And so Jesus had to withdraw away because of the fact that he is no ordinary king. But the Bible is clear that he is a king and that he has a kingdom. In fact, uh, I read this verse a couple weeks ago, but when he was about to be crucified, he was standing before Pilate and Pilate said, hey, are you a king? And he said, you're right in saying I'm a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. I am not the kind of king that you might think about or the kind of king that you are looking for. I'm a kind of king you've never seen and will never see again because I'm a different kind of king. And you know, luckily for us, 
if we're gonna step into this kingdom of God, we don't have to unlearn a whole lot about kingdoms because many of us, if you grew up in the United States, you don't know a lot about kingdoms, except what maybe you've learned in history books or watched on TV. Uh, we don't know a lot about that. So there's not a lot to unlearn necessarily, but there's still a huge learning process of understanding what the kingdom of God is like and how it functions and how even Jesus functioned as a king. Do we know what we mean when we say King Jesus? When we sing about him being our king, do we know what we mean by that and what he, how was he born a king when he really had none of the, the splendor and the acclaim and the pomp and circumstance that an earthly king would have? Because he was different in every way. He was different in birth, he was different in his life, and he was different in death than any other king. In fact, let's jump right in there. Let's, let's go through those, because I want to talk about those today to start off in my message. He was different in birth than any other king, than any earthly king could ever be. Even in how a king would be born, Jesus was different. He was no ordinary king. An earthly king, when they're born, they're gonna be born in a castle or in a palace, and they're gonna be surrounded by all the best medical professionals of their day, and they're gonna make sure it's sanitary and clean, and they're gonna make sure there's no infections anywhere, and that this baby king that's being born, or it's a prince and heir to the throne, they're gonna make sure that this little baby has all the advantages in the world of making sure that it was, he was born in a good place and he's gonna be healthy and strong. Jesus, coming as a king, was the exact opposite. He wasn't born in a palace or a castle. He was born in a barn, and he was placed in a feeding trough. I know we like the nativity scenes we see at Christmas with the, that we see you know, displayed on stages and outside of people's houses. They're, they're cute and they're beautiful, but the reality is Jesus was put in a place where animals would eat, and he, they put him in there because that's all they had. The opposite of what it would look like to be born in a palace or in a castle. He had the humblest of beginnings, and he chose to come this way you know, as Pastor Josh said during worship, you know, he could have came in a, as in a hurricane. He could have came in a more powerful way if he wanted to. He could have came any way he wanted. He chose to come as a baby. And it was right and good for God to do that so that we could experience, we could understand and relate to him having been born as a baby and growing up through all those things. The Bible says that he was tempted in every way, yet without sin. So he had to start from the very beginning to come into adulthood, to come into his ministry. And that's a blessing for us because we can relate to him because he took on the full form of humanity. He didn't just appear all of a sudden out of nowhere and start his ministry. But he was born, he was born different and the, the place that he was born was different. The announcement that's made when a king is born was different. When an earthly king is born, there's gonna be a big announcement. Trumpets, all kinds of ceremony, people, everybody in the kingdom is gonna gather around, wait for them to come out and say, the king has been born. They're gonna wait, it's gonna be a huge announcement, huge thing that all the dignitaries and the nobles and the royals are going to be there. They would not miss the announcement of the new king. Jesus was a little different. When Jesus was born, the announcement was made by an angel to who? Shepherds. It says the shepherds out in the field watching their flocks by night, an angel of the Lord appeared before them and announced the birth of this little baby Jesus. And you know, if you know anything about shepherds in that day, shepherds were not um, high class people. They were on the, on the totem pole. If there was a caste system, they were down here at the bottom. They, it, was not a, it was not an honorable profession. In fact, they usually had to watch their sheep outside of the city because they, people didn't want them in the city because they were dirty and just, they didn't like them. And they, it was not a, um, a highfalutin kind of position that someone would have. So instead of being announced to all the high ups, in society, Jesus purposely made sure that he was being announced to the, the lowest of the low when it comes to the, the societal standards. That was intentional. He didn't do that so we'd feel sorry for him. He had purpose in everything he did to let us know that he was here for the people. His clothing was even different. Even his clothing is documented in the word of God that it's different. A king's clothes is gonna be the best there is, right? Probably a tiny little robe even to put on a baby maybe even a little teeny crown with a little scepter they can hold. There's gonna, they're gonna have the best of the clothing. Jesus, obviously, again, the nativity scene is cute. We like to wrap a doll. When we do it, we wrap up a baby doll in a, in a little blanket, put it in the manger. The reality is he, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes, which really just means torn rags, just whatever they could find. They took whatever they could find, wrapped him up in it to keep him warm because he was outside in the night. Everything about Jesus being born was different. Than, a, than an earthly king would be. And this is not meant to do anything but to show us that he was a king 
for the people. And he wanted, he did this purposely so that people hungry for God would still, still see him as a king. That's what he wanted. He wanted those of us that had a heart for God to see him for who he was. He was different in birth. He was also different in life. The life of a king is a life full of privilege. It's full of every advantage in the world. Every comfort that a kingdom has to offer is at the king's fingertips. Nothing is out of his reach if he is the king. Every comfort that could possibly be is at his, at his disposal. And the posture that Jesus even had coming in as a king was completely different. A, a, an earthly king is to be exalted. His posture is one of exaltation, right? It's one of being high and lifted up. His throne was always high above everybody else so he could look down on everybody. That's how it was designed to be. They were above everybody. They didn't serve anyone. The idea of a king, even, even the idea of him serving someone would be offensive because that's not what he was here to do. He was here to be served. He is served in every way. He is fed by hand. If he wants to not even use, lift his hands to feed himself, he doesn't have to. There's nothing a king has to do. He has people all around him to make sure that he is served. And Jesus came just the opposite. He took the lowly position purposely in fact, he said very clearly in Matthew 20, verse 28, the reason he came, he said, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He did not come to be served. See, if you see him as a king and you know that he's actually a king that we say he is, him saying that is monumental. To think that a king would come and not want to be served is beyond comprehension for people of this day. And it's really beyond comprehension for us too, kings even today. They live to be served. That's what they're here for. Yet Jesus said, I came to serve and to give my life. At the last Passover that Jesus had with his disciples, he got down on his knees and bent down in front of his disciples, which for a king to get on his knees in front of every, anybody would have been completely objectionable. Got on his knees, washed their feet, which also, by the way, was the lowest of the low positions that a servant could have in any household. See what he was doing here? He was purposely being the antithesis of every other king that ever came but he had a reason for it. And then in authority, his life was different too. A king, an earthly king has complete dictatorial authority over his entire kingdom and you have to obey what he says. You have to submit to his rules and his laws. If you don't, it will be met with quick and swift and, and severe punishment. Jesus gave up all the authority he had. He didn't have any authority on this earth in the natural way that people had to do what he said they should do. There was, he, didn't, he couldn't inflict any punishment. He gave up all of his kingly authority when he came to this earth to serve humankind. And it was also different in accessibility in life. And this is one of my favorite ways that Jesus was different. You see, an earthly king is insulated from his people, right? If you're a commoner, like the overwhelming majority of us are, you're not getting an appointment with the king. You can't get the king's secretary's phone number and call and say, when can I get on his calendar? It doesn't work. There is no line to get in to see the king. He's completely insulated, completely removed from his people. If you have a problem, you deal with one of his underlings, right? But Jesus was different. He was no ordinary king. I love this so much because not only was he not insulated, not only was he just available, he went another step beyond that, and he invites us into his presence. He didn't just, he didn't keep us away by insulating. He didn't even just say like, you know, you can get on my calendar, but it's gonna be a while. He says, come, come into my presence. Come, be with me. It was completely different than any other king. For him to say, you're welcome in my presence is a powerful, powerful statement to, for him to make. And frankly, church, many of you might have grown up not really knowing this King Jesus that welcomes you into his presence. Maybe some of you grew up as I did, feeling like he doesn't really want me in his presence. He just wants me to obey his rules and stay out of his way. Little old me. I'm not a priest. I'm not, a, I'm not, a high, I'm not wealthy. I'm not a high and mighty person. I'm not someone of power. I can't come into the presence of God. He just wants me to obey him and stay out of the way. And many of you probably grew up that way too. And I can tell you today that that is not the King Jesus of the Bible. That is not who King Jesus really is, wanting us to just follow his rules and stay out of his way. 
and thinking that if I can come into his presence, well, it's only a church. Because for some reason, that's where Jesus resides. He's at church. So that's where I can actually come into the presence of God. But when I do that, it's kind of with this fear and intimidation, like not really knowing what to expect. Like, is he mad at me? Is he, you know, is something gonna happen? Am I, am I, is something gonna happen to me because I'm not really living the way I should? Can I tell you today, what Jesus did by making himself accessible and inviting us into his presence, what he is saying is the days of fearing God are over because of what he did. Now, don't take me wrong, there's still a reverence, there's still a respect for God, and frankly, if you're not living for God, there is a fear and a trembling. But when we are part of his family, and we are part of his kingdom, the fear of God is gone. We've come boldly into his throne room of grace, is what the Bible says. Nobody that's scared of his king is gonna come boldly into his throne room and talk to the king. Because frankly, you could die if you do that uninvited. Jesus says, oh no, come, come into my presence. It is one of the most freeing things you will ever hear about the character of God, is that even though he's a king, he invites us into his presence. Matthew eleven, twenty-eight, 28, Jesus says this very clearly. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's a king that's inviting you into his presence. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Praise God. Church, he is a church, or he is a God, he is a king for the weary and for the burdened. Can somebody say amen? We're all weary and we're all burdened. You live in America in 2022, you are weary and burdened, I guarantee it. You might be having a good week, you might be having a good day, you are weary and burdened. It's just, that's just the way of life nowadays. We don't have to live in that weariness and let it squash us, but it's always there rearing its head in our life. Unless you live in a cave, which you wouldn't be here if you did. So that is, that is the way life is today. There's burdens in life. There's weariness in life. He says, come to me. I'm inviting you into my presence. Come to me and I will give you rest for your souls. Not just for your physical body, but for your soul. When, let me tell you, when your soul needs rest, it, it doesn't matter how your physical body feels. If your soul is rested, you feel good because that's where it's at. And he's saying, come into my presence. He is a God for the weary and burned. He's, he's a God for the tired and the worn out. He's the God for the commoner. That's what's so great about him not being an ordinary king is that every other king was for his people and his nobles and his dignitaries and his royal family, just the people that were close to him. Jesus said, no, 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 that's over. I'm a God for the commoner. I'm a king for everybody. I want the shepherds to know before anybody else that I'm coming. That was on purpose, church. He wants you to know that it doesn't matter what position you hold in society, you are important to him. And if he comes, he's gonna announce it to you too because that's who he is, praise God. The angel said to the shepherds, first thing he said was, do not be afraid. I bring you good tidings of great joy for the people today. It's a really, really good thing that Jesus was born. A really, really good thing. So he was different in birth, he was different in life, and he was different in death. Even the way he died wasn't like an ordinary king. Praise God. When we think about the ranking, you know, a king ranks first in his kingdom. There's nobody higher ranked than the king, right? And if there's a, if there's a war, if there's a battle and the king goes to the battle with his, with his army like many kings did, the king's gonna stay back in the back most of the time and watch their, the battle happening. If the opposing army gets to the king, something has gone really, really bad for the king's kingdom because he's insulated, he's protected because he is the most important. If the king dies, that is a horrible loss for the kingdom. He's number one, he ranks first. Jesus was the opposite. He said, I willingly lay down my life. He didn't stand behind all of his soldiers and say, oh, you guys protect me with your very lives, protect me. Jesus said, uh-uh, get out of my way. I'm laying down my life. He said, no one takes my life from me. It wasn't a tragic scene, I say this all the time, but him getting crucified on the cross was not some tragedy that could have been stopped. He came to do that. He said, I, nobody's taking my life from me. I am laying it down willfully. Now listen, Jesus is not the first king to die a torturous, horrific death. Plenty of kings died that way. But he is the first and the only one to come for that purpose. To come for that exact reason to die for his people. No other king has ever done that. No other king ever will. 
He came and died in his prime for his people. That's who he is and who he was. Also the response, when a king dies, the response of the kingdom is one of mourning. The, the whole kingdom goes into mourning for, for days or weeks or months, practically. In fact, just you know, the, the modern example we have of that was the, the queen of England just passed away not too long ago. And again, unless you lived in a cave, you knew all about it, whether you wanted to or not. You were hearing about it on the news, the website, new, website news, TV news, all over the place, social media. It was everywhere. It was a huge deal. It impacted the world when this monarch passed away. And you saw it. And, and England and, and all of England's territories went into mourning and grieving over this death. That's normal for a king or a queen. When Jesus died, the result was more relief than anything. It was kind of a shoulder shrug. Like, okay. In fact, the Bible says that people were walking by him while he was on the cross, hurling insults, throwing expletives at him. They didn't care. And for the, for the leaders, they were glad because they thought he was a troublemaker. So even in how he died, he didn't die like a king would have died. But then there was the result. And this in all the ways that he was no ordinary king, this is the best one. This is the best aspect of him not being an ordinary king. When a king dies, the result of a king dying is pretty simple. They're dead. <laughs> They're dead. They're in a grave. Their, their reign, R-E-I-G-N, is over. It's over. The reign of a, their kingdom is over. All that's left is their legacy and the memory of that king because they're gone. When Jesus died, his reign was just beginning. That was the very beginning of his reign. You see, kings come to conquer their throne, to make sure they protect their throne, to make sure no one overtakes them while they are alive and their king on this throne. Kings live to conquer their throne. Jesus lived to conquer the grave. That's why he came. He had to die so that he could conquer the grave. The grave couldn't be conquered unless he died. And so his reign actually started when he died. This is the biggest difference. This is the biggest reason he was no ordinary king was because he had to die so that he could start his reign, so that he could defeat death, so that he could defeat the grave, so that he could bring salvation to you and to me, to bring life and to bring freedom for each and every one of us that believe and call upon the name of the Lord. Praise God for that. So, the question is, is he your king? Is he your king? Now, I realize you're, you're here today or you're listening online. And so, and if, you, if you're a Christian, you would say, well, of course he's my king. I mean, I, I, I stepped into salvation X number of years ago or months ago, whenever I did. I believe that Jesus is the savior of the world. I've asked him to forgive me my sins. I, I've, I've asked him into my life and I've given my life to him and, and I'm saved, and I mean, goodness sakes, I'm here at church today, aren't I? <laughs> of course he's my king. Can I tell you today, and this might shock you a little bit, but you know you could do all that and him still not be your king? You could do all that and him still not be your king? You can be part of his kingdom and him not be your king. You see, it's true that if you wanna be part of the kingdom of God, the only way into that kingdom is through the gate. Jesus talked about it. He said, he talked about how the, he had this sheep pen and that was, and it, that was a parable, parallel of the kingdom of God. And that if you wanna come into his sheep pen, he said, I have many sheep in my sheep pen. And if you wanna come into that sheep pen, the only way in is through the door. And Jesus says, I am the door. He says, I'm the gate. I am the way into this pen. So the only way to get into the pen is by salvation in Jesus, through Jesus. And so we celebrate that. We're thankful that that is the way to come into the kingdom of God. Not everybody living on the earth is part of the kingdom of God. To get into the kingdom of God, you have to go through the gate. The gate is Jesus. It's the description of salvation in our life. And if you are a Christian today, then you've had that experience where you have walked through that gate and walked into the kingdom of God and you are part of the kingdom of God. The problem is the tendency so often for us is to walk into that gate and just stand there and stay close to the gate. And we can live our life sometimes, if we're not careful, celebrating the gate. Celebrating the fact that, whew, glad I'm saved. Glad I'm not on that side of the fence anymore. I feel sorry for those guys. And we just celebrate that we're saved or we're celebrating the fact 
that we had this gate that we walked through. And you might say, well, shouldn't we celebrate the gate? The gate is Jesus. Well, of course we should. We celebrate the fact that he is the gate, but you know what else is really different about this kingdom than any, any other kingdom? Jesus said, I'm the gate, but you know what? Once you get in, he's also the shepherd. He's also your source. He's also your anchor. He's also your, your purpose. He, and he's also your king. The goal for us as followers of Jesus is not to just get inside the gate and stand there and pat ourselves on the back for how good we did to get in the gate. The goal for us as followers of Jesus is to go into the kingdom and to be part of the kingdom of God, to go deep, deep, deep into the kingdom. You see, he doesn't, the, the, the fact that he's not an ordinary king, the fact that he's not insulated, but he's accessible and he invites you into his presence, he's not just inviting you into the kingdom, that's the entry, but once you get into the kingdom, now he says, now I wanna invite you into a deeper place. I want to invite you in with me. And see, too often times, we want to be part of this incredible kingdom that he has created for all of us, but we really just want him to be kind of more like an ordinary king. Like, just keep your distance. I'll behave myself. You do your thing, I'll do mine. When I die, then we'll chat. But the reality is he doesn't want us to just stand there and him be an ordinary king because he's not an ordinary king. And when we come in, he says, now I want you to be part of my kingdom. I have a system that I want you to work under to be part of this kingdom that will honor me and be a blessing to the kingdom because when we come into the kingdom, it's not just about us anymore. Well, it never is really, but it's not even just about Jesus, it's about those in the kingdom and it's also about those that aren't in the kingdom yet. We're not called to live that, that way, that it is just about us rejoicing in the fact that, whew, I'm glad I got through that gate. That is the initial rejoicing that we have, but that's only the beginning of our life in the kingdom of God. See, when we step in through that gate, most of us, if not all of us, brought some baggage with us. You might have got rid of some of the baggage when you walked through the gate right away, because God does that. You've seen people get saved, they give their life to Jesus, and man, they had addiction that was broken off of them the moment they got saved, praise God. But even if you get addictions broken off of you, you're still coming in with baggage, because here's the thing. When you step into the spiritual kingdom of God, you're not leaving the flesh outside. The flesh has to come with you because we're still human beings living on this earth. The, the kingdom where the flesh stays away is the new one up in heaven when we get to go when we die. But till we're there, we're in this kingdom of God, but we still have this flesh. We're still carrying around this baggage. And Jesus is the kind of king that's not gonna be uninvolved and stay up in his palace and you just pay your taxes and, and be nice. He's the kind of king that gets involved and says, oh, I see your baggage, I'd like to deal with that. I'd like to take care of some of that for you. In fact, I'm insisting that we deal with your baggage. And we, too often times, don't want to let go of that baggage. We'll make, we'll, what we'll say is, yeah, you know, I just need to get closer to Jesus, or um, I just need to pray and ask Jesus to help me with this. We're wanting Jesus to take our baggage by force, when the reality is the Bible's clear, that's not how he does it. He says what you lay down, what you give to him, he will heal in our lives. He will take care of in our lives, but we have to surrender it. We too often don't wanna surrender it. We want him to take it from us so that we don't have to put any work in. See, oftentimes we wanna be part of the kingdom, but we don't really want him to be our king. And I, you know, this is, this is meant to encourage you guys because the beauty of who he is is that he doesn't condemn. He doesn't beat us down. He doesn't stand there and tap his foot and say, you're just not good enough. He's just always drawing us deeper into the kingdom. He's saying, come, come, come to me, I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest from those burdens in your life. Some things, yeah, we do need supernatural healing from God. If there is generational stuff and there's addictions in our life, and we need God to do supernatural work, but a lot of things we deal with, it's just a matter of the fact, matter that we just need to just lay it down and let him have it and just walk away from it. And he's saying, I want to help you with that. I want to come. He says, come, give me your burdens. He didn't say, stand there and I'm gonna come up to you and I'm gonna take those burdens from you and I'm gonna throw them in the pit of hell where they belong. He says, give them to me. Bring them to me. Bring your burdens and then I will give you rest. That's who he is. That's the God that he is for each and every one of us. He is not an ordinary God. Galatians 5, 17 it says the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit was contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want him to do or what you want to do. So when Jesus, when you come into his kingdom and he says, hey, you got some baggage, I want to deal with it. Immediately there's conflict. Immediately. It doesn't matter who you are. 
Every time God wants to deal with your baggage, there's conflict because my flesh doesn't wanna deal with my baggage. My flesh is just fine and dandy with my baggage. And I still have that flesh. So there is a conflict there and we have to be intentional against that conflict. We have to be intentional to consistently lay it down and say, Jesus, I want you to be my king. I don't wanna hold anything back. That baggage will cause us to hold things back from him. And he said, I don't want you to hold anything back. If, if, you're, if you're not in a depth of relationship with me you want to be, it's because you are holding back. And he's saying, leave that stuff. Lay it down. Let me deal with it. If you want to live a life worthy of the kingdom of God, you can't just hang out at the gate. He has to be your king. Colossians 1. This was the apostle Paul wrote this letter to the church in Colossae. And he was praying for them. And he said this. He said, we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in this wonderful kingdom of light that is not like any other kingdom. It's an unordinary kingdom. He says the Father has qualified you so live a life worthy to please him in every way, bearing fruit in your life. So the inheritance that we get from our God is not found hanging on the outskirts of this kingdom that God has created for us. We are called to live a life worthy to please him in every way. And I know if you're not careful, that can sound a lot like works. Like, man, now you're talking to me about having to earn my salvation, earn my good standing with God. Nope, absolutely not. Ephesians 2 is crystal clear that we are saved by faith through grace it is not from man, and it is not by works, and it is a gift from God so that no man can boast. Praise God. That is the gate. That is the salvation that we step into. There is no other way. But that's not the end of it. Once we get in, it is very clear as well, Paul's saying live a life worthy of the kingdom. Live a life worthy. So what does that look like? How do I know if I'm living a life worthy of the kingdom? Because see, our, our minds would immediately go to, this is where mine goes to, if I'm, just, if I'm not careful, my mind immediately goes to, okay, live a life worthy of the kingdom, live a life worthy of the kingdom. Okay, good. That means I've got to do the things the Bible says. I've got to be nice. I've got to be kind. I've got to be full of joy. I've got to be patient. I, I can't have road rage. I've got to forgive everybody. I've got to love people. I've got to love even Yankees. I've got to love politicians. I've got to love people in the media. I've got to love everybody. I've got to do all these things that, that what a good Christian does. That is not what living a life worthy is. That's the outworking of living a life worthy. That's the fruit of living a life worthy. Can I tell you what living a life worthy looks like? Good, I'll show you. Very quickly. It says, there's three, there's three examples I'm gonna give you very quickly that show what, uh, I talk about worthiness of the kingdom of God, okay? And uh, uh, they all center around the same theme. The first one is from the wedding feast in Matthew 22, where the king, this is a parable that Jesus gives, he says the king uh, was having a wedding feast for his son and he invited all the people that they knew, the people close to them, all their friends, said, hey, come to my son's wedding feast. It's gonna be beautiful. Everybody resisted, said, no, I can't come. So he sent his servants out a second time and said, tell them it's gonna be awesome. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Uh, but he was telling about the food they're gonna have. It's gonna be awesome. You're gonna wanna come to this. They still refused. Some of them said, no, I got, I got my field I need to tend to. Some of them said, no, I have this business I need to look after. I can't come. So finally, in Matthew uh, 22, verse eight, this is what the king says. It says, then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to the next one and then I'll explain it. Luke 9, 61. This is when Jesus was really getting popular and people wanted to be around him. And somebody came to him and said, hey, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Or in other words, no one, they're not worthy of the kingdom of God. Sounds pretty harsh, just wanted to say bye to his mama. He wouldn't let him do it, and he's not worthy of the kingdom of God. I'll explain that in a, in a second too. The third one is out of Matthew 10, 37, where Jesus says, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's pretty harsh too. It's hard to keep that even in line. Do I love God more than I love my kids? Uh, today, maybe, yesterday, probably not. Right, I mean, it just kind of varies depending on how you feel a certain day. So he says, these, these, you got these three situations 
all seem pretty harsh. Say, man, I'm, I'm not worthy of the kingdom because I wanted to go say bye to my mom or because I didn't come to your wedding party. They all have the same exact theme behind every one of them. And it explains what makes us worthy of the kingdom of God. All three of these situations, these people did not understand the worthiness of Jesus. That's what it was. They didn't understand how worthy Jesus was. They put other things ahead of Jesus, thinking that Jesus was just one of those ordinary kings that they're just gonna add to their life. The guy said, I wanna go say bye to my parents. That's not necessarily just running up, saying bye real quick, hugging them and leaving. That could have taken weeks or months. This guy was putting his family before he was putting Jesus in the, the rank. The people that wouldn't come to the wedding feast, they're saying, oh no, thanks for the invite, but my business is more important than Jesus. My, my farm, my field is more important than Jesus. It's, it all comes back to understanding that he is worthy. Our worth of being part of the kingdom of God is 100% based on how much we know that he is worthy. That's it. That's it, church. Like, it's really, really simple. You don't have to figure out if you're good enough to be part of the kingdom of God because it has nothing to do with how good you are. It has to do with what you know and what you believe about your God. If you understand that he's worthy, the fruit, which is being nice, going to church, reading your Bible, doing all those good things Christians do, that's the fruit of someone that knows how good and how worthy he is of my life. That's, that's it. That's all it is. If you wanna know if you're worthy of the kingdom, what do you think of Jesus? Do you look at him as just this, this king, but yeah, but he just came, he died for me, thanks for it, Jesus. Uh, I'll catch up with you sometime. Or is he your life? Because he's meant to be your life. He's meant to be the most valuable thing in your life. That's why he said the first commandment, you have no other gods before me. You will put nothing before me because that is who our God is. He knows that there really is nothing before him. There's nothing above him. So if you don't understand that, you're really not coming into and being part of the kingdom. You're just kind of hanging out at the gate. He says, if you want to be worthy of my kingdom, it comes by knowing that I am worthy and that you are not worthy. It's like repentance. The fruit of repentance in our life is that, is that when we repent, we will change. We'll do things differently, right? That's the fruit of repentance in our life. Repentance comes not because you know that you did something you shouldn't do, but because you know that he is worthy of your repentance. See, when I was younger in my faith and just getting started and didn't really have a whole understanding, well, I knew enough of the Bible to know if I did something wrong, I needed to repent of it. And so I would do it, but it was because I was just sorry because I didn't wanna make God mad. Or I might've made him mad and I need him to bless me. Christmas is close, I wanna get good gifts, so God, forgive me for all my sins, right? Now, when I repent, it's not because I feel bad because I think God might be mad at me. Now, when I do something wrong, which by the way, I, I mess up every single day, and when I do, I repent, but it's not because I just don't want God to be mad at me, but it's because I just know he is so worthy of my repentance. He is so worthy of my life being about him and not being about me. Because when I need to repent, it's because I made my life about me. That's what it is, that's, that's what sin is. It's making your life about you. And so when I make it about me, it's not about him. That's why I repent. And the fruit of repentance is turning back to him and saying, my life is yours, God. Everything in my life is yours. You are the only one that deserves my life and you deserve it all. That's why we worship church. That's why we sing songs. It's not so we can just have a little fun at the beginning of a service until the preacher gets up here. It's because worship is huge. You don't even have to feel it when you start to worship. What we do when we worship is we're just declaring who he is. We're declaring how great he is and how worthy he is. When we sing, you're worthy of it all because you gave it all up for me. And, and shout if you know that the king is in residence here. The fact that he invites us into his presence has got to do something to stir our hearts. And if it doesn't, we've been saved and living at the gate too long. Because if you're in the kingdom, it is stirring you up when you start to think about how awesome he is and how awesome you're really not. And that is what worship is. That is what repentance is. That is what living a life worthy of the kingdom of God looks like. And that's what he wants. He is not an ordinary king and it's not an ordinary kingdom. And he wants us to not be ordinary citizens of his kingdom because he has done everything so that we can be a major part of it. Would you stand with me, please? Praise God. I love you guys. I'm glad you're here today. And I hope that, it, that this challenges you and encourages you. The fruit that comes from our life is not something that we do because we're just trying really hard. It's something that is an outpouring of a life that knows that he is worthy. 
that he is really so much greater than any other king. And it, sometimes it can be a challenge for us because when you look at how he came as a king on this earth, nothing about him looked like a king. But, he, but it, was, it wasn't until the end really that you really saw how incredible what he was doing really was. Uh, I was saying in the first service, there's these trees that scientists and horticulturalists have figured out a way to remove this, the fruit producing DNA out of certain fruit trees. And they put these fruit trees in really nice neighborhoods uh, to dress them up because they look really good, but they don't have any fruit. I don't know how they remove these genes. It's really incredible. I mean, it's amazing. But anyway, they have these trees that uh, they're called domesticated fruit trees. They have no fruit. They don't want the fruit on them because then you have to maintain them more. And the fruit falls and gets messy on the ground, but they're p- pretty trees. So they've removed the fruit. So all it is is a fruit tree with no fruit, which is fine for trees. You know, we, whatever you want to do, I guess but we have to make sure as Christians that that isn't who we are, that we're not domesticated fruit trees, that we're not living in the kingdom but not having any fruit in our life, that that fruit producing gene hasn't been removed out of our life. The fruit producing gene in every single Christian to ever walk on this planet is the same. The fruit producing gene in us is knowing that he is worthy. That's it. It's really that simple church. It really is. I know it's not easy to live a life in such a way that you're always focusing on how great he is, but the more we can do that in our life, the more things come into focus and we under, you can understand and live in such a way that the fruit comes out of your life in a, in, a, in a way that it's not being forced, but it's actually the outpouring of your life. I can tell you I love Jesus more today than I've ever loved him in my life. And it just grows every single day. And it's, it's changed in my life when I started focusing on him and not on what he can do for me when I just focus and when I genuinely worship him and just declare who he is in my life. And it's amazing how it even shifts your thinking when you start meditating on who he actually is. Not just coming to him and saying, God, I need you to heal my body. I need you to fix my job. I need you to fix my relationships. Not just focusing on those things, but just saying, God, you're just worthy. You're worthy of it all. If he never does another thing in my life, he's worthy of my life. If he never does another thing, because frankly, at the end of this is when it really gets good. <laughs> but he's so good that that's not even who he is. Of course, he's going to do things for the rest of my life. Every air, every breath I breathe is a blessing from him because that's who he is. That is the key for each and every one of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today because we know that you are good. Your mercy endures forever. Lord, you are no ordinary king and I can't be more happy that you are not just some monarch that sat on a throne with a crown that had your reign on this earth, but your reign started when you died. Your reign started then, and three days later, you rose again, and you are ascended back to heaven. You are at the right hand of the Father. You are interceding for me. God, what a humbling proposition to think that you are interceding for me. Lord, I thank you. You are so worthy. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our lives. God, would you reveal your worthiness to us in a greater measure. Reveal yourself to us in a greater way so that there would be, so the fruit producing gene would not be extracted out of our lives, but it would be evident and that we would be fruitful and we would live lives worthy of your kingdom. For your glory, God, thank you for bringing us into this unordinary kingdom. We love you. We honor you today, Lord. Help us to honor you as we go through the rest of this Christmas season. Be glorified in our midst, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, amen, amen.